Just a quick announcement before the video itself. My debut xenofiction novel is now available for pre-order from Fenris Publishing. Winter Without End is a post-apocalyptic survival story told through the eyes of a dog, who makes an uneasy alliance with a wounded wolf in order to survive. Details and links are available in the description. And now for the feature presentation. The Fox and the Hound is a novel with an interesting legacy. For most people, the title brings to mind the colorful 1981 animated feature from Walt Disney Studios, a story of two animal friends who develop a youthful bond only to find themselves on opposite sides of a long-standing feud they played no part in starting. It's a classic storytelling motif, that of the star-crossed companions, a tale as old as human tribal division, that is to say, as old as humanity itself. Todd and Copper could easily be a white and black child in the Jim Crow era American South, or a Protestant and Catholic in 80s Belfast, or an Israeli and Palestinian in the West Bank today, and I think this universal applicability has gone a long way towards ensuring that the story remains rooted in the public consciousness. But while the film does a good job of exploring this subject, fans of the original novel are quick to point out that the animated feature bears almost no resemblance to its source a brutal, unsentimental tale of a long-running blood feud between a hunter and his hound and a wild fox. Unfortunately, this approach in turn leaves out crucial components of the novel's message, often reducing its quote-unquote true meaning to a mere depiction of the brutality of life in the wild. To be clear, Daniel Manick certainly didn't shy from portraying the natural world in all its graphic, unadulterated truth. But to limit the messaging of the book to a simple elaboration of the phrase, nature, red in tooth and claw, misses the deeper messaging buried beneath this violent veneer. Looking to the title of this video, when I say we missed the point of The Fox and the Hound, I don't mean to devalue the heartwarming themes of Disney's loose adaptation, or to deny the stark brutality present in the original novel, but rather to shine a light on the underlying message that I believe Daniel P. Mannix excellently, if also quite subtly, conveyed in his overshadowed, and in my view widely misunderstood, literary masterpiece. In writing The Fox and the Hound, Mannix created what I consider to be the definitive xenofiction novel addressing modern humanity's relationship with and stewardship over the wild. But understanding the three key aspects that set it apart from and above its contemporaries will require a bit of background. While I ultimately believe that any work of art should be able to stand on its own merits, no work is produced in a vacuum, and so when attempting to discern the intentions of an author, it can certainly help to understand the circumstances in which their work was written. The Fox and the Hound was first published in 1967, a time when the state of American conservation was particularly dire. Widespread usage of toxic and carcinogenic chemicals in agriculture, the extensive dumping of industrial waste into the nation's waterways, and the near-total eradication of predatory species from large segments of the country sparked a growing concern among scientists and public officials that the era's unchecked and unquestioned practices were rapidly driving America towards ecological collapse. As a new debate ignited over human management, or mismanagement, of the natural world, one species in particular found itself in a starring role. Not the wily red fox, but its taxonomical cousin, the coyote, Canis latrans, who had long lived in the shadow of one of mankind's most ancient adversaries, the wolf. As a large, highly social apex predator requiring extensive rangeland to sustain itself, the gray wolf ruled the wilds of North America in the era before European colonization, but the species could never have hoped to endure the worst of human ingenuity. 
Facing extensive persecution at the hands of colonists from the earliest landings in the 1600s, the wolf fought a long and ultimately doomed battle for the right to exist alongside the continent's new masters. In 1924, the last wolf pack was killed in California, and though individuals and even packs would from time to time cross the Canadian border into sections of Michigan, Minnesota, North Dakota, and Montana, and isolated populations managed to cling to survival in rural New Mexico, by this point the gray wolf had effectively been extirpated from the lower 48 states. But nature abhors a vacuum, and mankind soon found that they had removed a primary competitor and opened vital habitat land to the song dogs of the prairie. A mid-sized, semi-social omnivore native to the American Great Plains and Southwest, the coyote experienced a unique opportunity around the turn of the 20th century. With its highly intelligent and adaptable nature, the species rapidly expanded its range beginning in the mid to late 1800s, and by the middle of the 20th century, coyote howls could be heard from coastal California to the suburbs of New York City, and from Fairbanks, Alaska to the Florida Panhandle. But this expansion did not go unnoticed by man. Beginning around the time of the Second World War, and growing exponentially through the 1960s, the Department of the Interior, in conjunction with the sheep industry, which wielded significant political power across much of the western U.S., ramped up its program of predator control, employing armies of hunters, trappers, and poisoners, and saturating vast swaths of the West with extremely dangerous poisons such as thallium, strychnine, and sodium fluoroacetate, the latter colloquially known as 1080, and traps such as the indiscriminate coyote-getter cyanide guns. Thankfully, the advent of the environmentalist movement brought new attention to the burgeoning crisis. In his shocking and often infuriating 1971 expose, aptly and evocatively titled Slaughter the Animals, Poison the Earth, journalist Jack Olson documented the grotesque and shocking excesses, mismanagement, and corruption surrounding the numerous federal, state, and local predator control programs, then overseen by the Fish and Wildlife Services Department of the U.S. Department of the Interior. Olson shined a light on the bureaucratic absurdities and ecological ignorance of those involved with the poisoning programs where predominantly wealthy sheep barons would overgraze public lands to the point of literal desertification, paying minuscule fees for the right to do so and failing to adequately protect their own livestock, while taxpayers footed much of the bill for wildlife control programs that sought to eradicate all predators anywhere they could be found, run by people who frequently flouted local and state ordinances and even federal regulations by setting traps and poison on private property and within protected parklands. Citing the old adage of Parkinson's Law, an observation that bureaucracies tend to find work to justify their continued existence, Olson described in excruciating detail how fish and wildlife officials would often solicit important figures in the sheep industry for grossly exaggerated reports on losses to predation, in turn feeling paranoia among farmers about out-of-control predators in a disastrous positive feedback loop. As the number of predators killed increased with every passing year, this was only cited as evidence of the need for further poisoning and trapping, in turn producing even larger predator harvests, with the few efforts made by local and state lawmakers to rein in these programs amounting to political suicide. Perhaps worst of all was that many government officials, ostensibly in power to promote conservation and protect the country's natural resources, would often demonstrate shocking ignorance of basic ecological principles, claiming that predatory species which had lived on the continent for well over a million years would eradicate game animals within half a decade if left unchecked. Even as deer and elk herds experienced dramatic population upheavals in the absence of predation, seeing explosions in numbers followed swiftly by mass starvation and rampant disease, and thereby necessitating significant and costly human management. Olson's book is primarily concerned with the plight of the coyote, though he notes that the black bear, mountain lion, bobcat, red fox, and bald and golden eagle were also particularly affected, some being driven to the brink of extinction by the time of the book's publication and that dozens if not hundreds of other species were caught in the crossfire simply by virtue of living in the same environment as targeted species. By the beginning of the 1970s, the situation had grown so dire that throughout large portions of the American West, so indiscriminate and widespread was the distribution of poisoned carcasses, baits, and traps that simply allowing a dog to roam free from a leash beyond the limits of a city or controlled suburb was tantamount to a death sentence for the creature and dozens of humans found themselves injured or killed as well. The eastern U.S. fared better with regards to poisoning, particularly due to the absence of any well-established sheep industry and the prior extirpation of most larger predators, 
but extensive industrial poisoning of waterways, employment of hazardous agricultural pesticides, and clearing of land had left the American wild in a precarious state. And the eastern half of the country only truly found itself spared the excesses of so-called control employed in the west because most of its larger predatory species had long since been eradicated. By 1971, the gray wolf and grizzly bear had not been spotted in the contiguous United States for decades. The red wolf had all but been annihilated, reduced to a handful of isolated populations in the deep south. The North American subspecies of mountain lion had been driven to the edge of extinction, with many scientists expecting their end to come within two or three decades at most. The black bear, bobcat, and bald eagle lay only a few decades behind, and even the coyote and red fox, two of the most versatile, adaptable predators on the planet, could not hope to endure forever. It was amidst this backdrop that Daniel Mannix emerged as one of the foremost naturalist authors of the time. Having initially pursued a zoology degree, only to turn to journalism, the enterprising Pennsylvanian published his first book, The Backyard Zoo, in 1934, detailing his experiences caring for a variety of wild animals on a family farm, with a follow-up released two years later. Over the next two decades, he would write for various publications as a journalist, in addition to serving as a naval lieutenant in the Second World War, briefly performing in a traveling carnival as a fire eater and sword swallower, practicing stage magic, working on screenplays, and pursuing his interests in wildlife as a hunter and naturalist. Settling down as a novelist by the 1950s, Mannix would publish a number of books on a variety of subjects, mostly involving history or hunting, before turning his attention to the growing ecological crisis. In 1965, he published his first work of xenofiction, The Last Eagle, following the perilous life of a bald eagle as it struggles to survive in a world of DDT usage, overhunting, egg poaching, and habitat loss, all of which had contributed to the species being reduced to only a few hundred mate pairs in the contiguous U.S. by 1960. Mannix's novel helped to bring awareness to the plight of the national bird, and likely contributed to it being placed on the endangered species list a year and a half later but it also seems to have awoken something within its author. A desire to combine his history as a journalist and love of the natural world with his talents as a novelist and unique insight into the behavior of wild animals. And so, beginning in 1966 and well aware of what was going on across the country, he set about crafting what would become his xenofiction magnum opus, The Fox and the Hound. Anyone acquainted with naturalist animal xenofiction, or stories told from the perspective of non-physically anthropomorphized real-world animals, will understand Mannix's choice of placing a fox in the role of protagonist. As I have discussed extensively in several prior videos, the fox is an animal with an enduring appeal, a cunning trickster whose predations never rise to the threatening level of its larger lupine cousins an omnivorous, highly adaptive, and primarily solitary creature whose size, stealth, agility, and wit have allowed it to not only endure but thrive in humanity's shadow, even as so many other species find themselves driven to the brink of annihilation, if not beyond it. Fox stories have long played an important role in cultures around the world, from the Reynard cycle of medieval Europe, to the creation myths of many Native American tribes, to the kitsune of Japanese yokai tales. And so, in the late 1800s, with the advent of naturalist animal xenofiction, which avoided the physical anthropomorphizing of their predecessors, it should be no surprise that the fox quickly assumed a prominent place in this new literary genre, becoming one of the most commonly featured, and widely celebrated, species. Ernest Thompson Seton's Wild Animals I Have Known, William J. Long's Ways of Wood Folk, and Charles G.D. Roberts' The Kindred of the Wild, three xenofiction anthologies that were highly popular around the turn of the 20th century, all feature the red fox to some extent, and through the 1960s, the fox continued to be among the most likely stars in any given novel told through the eyes of a beast. Initially, naturalist animal xenofiction tended to prioritize heavy-handed progressive-era political messaging, and a high degree of sentimentalizing of its animal characters, falling into what I have labeled the moralist subgenre. For instance, in Anna Sewell's Black Beauty, the first proper NAX work, the titular horse understands the English speech of her owners just as well as the novel's human characters, and contemplates grandiose political, ethical, and moral concepts such as abuse, legal equality, and temperance. 
Likewise, the fox of Long's Ways of Woodfolk possesses a practically human-level intellect and conception of fairness and justice in dealing with his two-legged neighbors. But around the dawn of the new century, moralist xenofiction rapidly faded in popularity in favor of what I have labeled the realist subgenre, which eschewed the sentimentality of earlier NAX works and instead aimed to tell grounded, accurate stories of animals from their perspectives. The Fox and the Hound follows in this tradition, being told through the eyes and noses of the eponymous creatures, a wild fox briefly raised by humans after being orphaned, and his arch-rival, one of the many tracking hounds owned by a local woodsman. But the first thing that sets Mannix's magnum opus apart from its contemporaries is the level of dedication to realism. While the author himself admitted in the book's end note that any time a human being writes from the perspective of another creature, some degree of anthropomorphizing will be inevitable, the accomplished naturalist did his best to portray his animal characters' thoughts and actions as realistically as possible, even going so far as to raise and observe a pair of foxes for more than a year. And while this dedication to accuracy does, in my view, often render his prose somewhat dry as a result, it manages to place readers into the minds of flesh-and-blood inhabitants of the wild in a way I'm not sure another author has ever quite managed. On its surface, The Fox and the Hound chronicles a long and bitter rivalry between an unnamed huntsman and his prized hound, Copper, as the two attempt to capture an elusive fox, known to the audience as Todd. The story begins in a rural setting, told from Copper's perspective as his master is roused by local law enforcement late at night to attempt to track down a fugitive or missing person, the distinction being lost on the hound. Copper successfully locates his quarry, only to find the man dead with the scent and prints of a black bear surrounding the corpse. Several days later, the same bear begins preying on a local farmer's flock, and the master deploys his pack to hunt the beast down. The dogs manage to track the bear and hold it at bay long enough for the armed men to arrive, but when the creature threatens the life of the master, Copper, despite his experience and devotion to the man, cannot bring himself to confront the beast. As the older hound wavers, Chief, a much younger dog, rushes in to save their master, earning him the man's praise and leaving Copper bitterly jealous. In the following chapter, we are shown the early life of the fox, beginning with the moment his family's den is besieged by local farmers employing terriers. The terrified fox watches helplessly as his mother and siblings are ruthlessly killed, but after managing to avoid the dog's attention in the chaos, he is noticed by one of the men, who takes pity on the pup and decides to bring him home. Given the name Todd, the fox is reared by the farmer until he reaches maturity, at which point his owner turns him loose. Todd quickly adapts to life in the idyllic wilds of his birth, and soon discovers the property of Copper's master, finding enjoyment in taunting the chained pack of hounds. This game becomes a regular part of Todd's routine, until one day Chief's chain breaks, and the dog launches into a long-winded pursuit of the fox, which ends when Todd leads the inexperienced dog to its death at the hands of an oncoming train. Copper's master then becomes consumed with a desire to avenge the dog that saved his own life, training Copper to ignore the scent of other foxes as they employ various hunting and trapping techniques in their quest to kill Todd. Over the following years, the fox manages to secure several mates, only to watch as they and his offspring are inevitably killed by the vengeful huntsman. In the meantime, the rural valley within which this drama plays out steadily undergoes suburbanization, Forests are clear-cut and fields leveled to make way for housing developments and factories. Streams become choked with pollution and dry up, and asphalt roads packed with fume-spewing vehicles replace woodland game trails and dirt farm lanes. The master watches as his fellow farmers and huntsmen sell their livestock, hounds, and lands to retire, leaving him embittered and alone as his new suburban neighbors resent his rugged nature. When the changing state of the valley leaves him facing destitution, the man is forced to sell most of his property and all of his pack save copper, and descends into alcoholism as their bitter feud with Todd remains the only source of meaning in his life. But after the local wildlife population finds itself in the grip of an outbreak of rabies, terrifying the valley's newer and less nature-savvy inhabitants, the master once more finds a semblance of purpose and community when his neighbors seek his aid and expertise. Employing poisoned baits to eradicate the fox population, which suffers most at the hands of the terrible disease, the man inadvertently catches numerous other species in the crossfire, resulting in a mass die-off of wildlife, wreaking havoc on local pets, and even causing the death of a human child. 
Forced to abandon the effective yet indiscriminate technique, the Master and his cohorts employ greyhounds in an attempt to run down the few surviving foxes in the valley, but Todd, despite having lost much of his youthful vigor, still manages to escape death. In the novel's last chapter, the aging copper picks up the scent of his hated rival one morning while out for a walk with his master, and launches into pursuit one final time. In a gripping chase that lasts the full day, through the night and into the next morning, Todd is unable to lose the hound, finally dropping dead from exhaustion, whereupon copper collapses atop his mortal foe. The triumphant master then nurses his beloved hound back to health, and the two briefly bask in the glow of their victory, winning praise and admiration from their more civilized neighbors for finally besting the long-elusive Todd, the last of his kind in the entire valley. But soon, the man's family members resume pressuring him to sell off the last of his property and move into a retirement home. And after losing his last source of pride, meaning, and purpose, and with no work remaining to him, the despondent master eventually gives in. Accepting that there is no place for him in his old homeland, now unrecognizable to him from the pristine, rugged wilderness he once loved, and knowing that Copper will have no place with him, the master fetches a shotgun and leads his faithful hound out into the woods one final time. The master made him lie down, and then held one hand over his eyes. Copper lay trustingly and contentedly. The master knew best. Did he recall the many good times they had had together, and this last great run? A day and a night, and part of another day? Of course he did. Copper gave the master's hand one last lick. He did not care what happened as long as he would never be separated from the master, for he had killed the great fox, and in this miserable, fouled land there was no longer any place for fox, hound, or human being. A tragic end to a brutal tale, and one that manages to capture the unpleasant aspects of nature that those less familiar with its darker side would often rather ignore. Upon release, the novel drew widespread praise for its realistic and accurate depictions of life in the wild from non-human perspectives, and it's not hard to see why. Mannix's careful research and extensive use of scent-based sensory imagery in the book's meticulously crafted hunting and tracking sequences go to great lengths to ground the reader in the mind and body of his animal protagonists. The scent held well in the forest, and the pack pressed on, reassuring one another by their rhythmic baying that they were all still on the line. When the woods were open, the scent lay breast high and the hounds were able to follow it without dropping their heads, a great advantage. In the deeper woods where the sun had not as yet penetrated, the air was cold and the scent still lay on the ground. Here the hounds were forced to drop their heads, and this slowed them. At times the scent failed completely. At such times the pack stopped their baying and anxiously fanned out, each hound working on his own to find the line. Copper usually found it. He knew all the best places to check. The hollow formed by two roots at the base of a tree, a damp spot where the scent might cling, a protected hollow where a scent might have drifted and could not rise again. Often he was able to take it from bushes that had touched the bear's sides. The scent particles clung to the oily surface of the leaves, while it would not adhere to dead leaves on the ground or the bare earth. Occasionally one of the other hounds would strike something and speak to it doubtfully. Copper would hurry over to check the spot, the rest would wait until they heard his affirmative deep bay. The Fox and the Hound lacks the human sentimentality found in nearly all other xenofiction works, even the weak degree common to much of the realist tradition. Todd is first and foremost a wild animal, one who kills without restraint or remorse, who mates without shame or romance, who scavenges carrion, lays scats and marks his territory just as readily as he breathes and sleeps, who sees, smells, hears and comprehends the world in an alien manner. His first memory was that of hearing an eager scratching at the mouth of the den, followed by excited whines. The fox pup was not frightened. Instead, he was excited and curious, for the noises were not unlike fox noises, and he knew of no reason to fear them. His mother reacted differently. In a moment, she was on her feet, hissing and snarling, and although the pup had never heard these sounds before, he instantly recognized them as danger signals. Then she gave off the terrible scent of fear, and even though this was a new scent to the pup, he knew it meant the family was in dire peril. Additionally, Mannix uses his extensive knowledge of hunting and trapping in detailing the ingenious and often insidious methods the master employs in his attempts to kill Todd, 
from luring in his mate with the cries of a wounded pup to gassing his den sites, and from laying carefully disguised mangling leghold traps to coursing with greyhounds after managing to flush the fox from cover. But unfortunately, the extensive focus on the novel's brutal realism, accurate as both critics and general readers are to recognize it, seems to have overshadowed the deeper messaging that Mannix intended to convey about humanity's rule over, and place in, the environment. The Fox stories that preceded Mannix's 1967 masterpiece are nearly as diverse as they are numerous, with portrayals of their vulpine heroes ranging from a begrudgingly respected roguish thief to a brave champion of the wild, fighting against the technologically superior man, and from a simply clever beast to a creature with a level of intelligence nearly matching humanity's own. These stories take place in locales as distinct and wide-ranging as the idyllic fox-hunting country of southern and central England, the forests of the St. Lawrence River Basin, the rugged peaks of the Rockies, and the suburban sprawl that came to epitomize much of post-war American life. But despite their differences, what nearly all of these stories share in common aside from celebrating the fox and setting it against mankind, is a degree of reverence for the natural world, and an admonishment of humanity's destructive tendencies. These range from condemnations of cruel trapping methods, to criticism of poaching, from warning against careless fire starting, to derision of overzealous farmers with simplistic and outdated attitudes towards predators, and from concerns about pollution and the use of poison, to a somber observation of the gradual loss of pristine wilderness in the face of humanity's steady expansion. However, an important thing to note is that in nearly all of these works, the author's handling of conservation is usually not particularly subtle, nor is it ever truly central to the overall plot. The relationship between mankind and our environment is frequently touched upon, but never integral, even as the surface-level narratives often pit their fox protagonists against a vengeful trapper or veteran master of hounds. The trio of pioneering xenofiction anthologies mentioned earlier all pay lip service to the idea of nature being something worth preserving, and occasionally venture into critiques of certain harmful practices, but these elements never occupy a central place in the messaging, nor do they truly permeate their respective narratives. The works of Seton, Long, Roberts, David Stephen and Jim Shellgard all touch on conservationist issues in their own ways, and Beebe's excellent Wild Loan is underscored by a sense of nostalgia for the British countryside, facing steady erosion at the time of its writing. But these are, first and foremost, simply novels about wildlife, novels that assume an antagonistic relationship between man and beast as the default state of existence, and yet offer little commentary on the trajectory of that relationship. Humans are expected to make appearances and cause harm, but they simply arrive, do their damage, and then leave, and the natural world continues to live on relatively unchanged. Some of the animal heroes survive the end of their respective books, while others are killed by rivals, shot by hunters, or die of disease or old age. But these deaths are always portrayed as simply another part of the cycle of the natural world, a cycle that will continue indefinitely, one that is never in any true danger of breaking forever. And here we come to the second element that sets the fox and the hound apart from other naturalist fox stories, beyond strict adherence to realism. The core themes that underlie the entire novel. Mannix didn't merely write another fox story, but a story about fox stories, and xenofiction in general, playing to the genre's strengths in delivering his message in a manner that manages to both remain subtle and yet permeate the entirety of the book. Unlike even the most realistic of its predecessors, in The Fox and the Hound, every animal character's life is ultimately overshadowed and defined by its relationship to humans. From the den to the grave, Todd's story finds his existence guided and shaped by the hand of his environment's masters. His earliest memory is that of the slaughter of his mother and siblings at the hands of a group of farmers and their terriers, and his survival only comes about when one of the men spares him out of pity. Todd's adoptive human father raises him to maturity, giving the fox his name before turning the wild creature loose. And from here on, Todd is forced to learn and adapt to an ever-changing landscape in which his kind are steadily less welcome. Even the structure of the novel places emphasis on Todd's growing powerlessness before mankind's encroach. Aside from the first two introductory chapters, simply titled The Hound and the Fox, in which their respective characters are established, 
Every chapter is named for the type of hunting employed within it, each a new danger that Todd must evade and outwit simply to continue living, and each growing less sporting and more difficult to escape. The gradual transformation of the valley from a pristine environment in which man and beast reside in general harmony to a heavily developed, sterilized landscape hostile to anything not carefully cultivated by humanity is shown to the reader in background details that one might easily miss on an initial reading. In the first chapter, the land lays quiet and tranquil in the dark of night, with the lone nearby highway all but empty. The occasional plume of truck exhaust or stench of a discarded cigarette stand out sharply to Copper's nose against the idyllic rural scenery. Streams flow cold and pure, rough woodland abounds, and predators as large and formidable as black bears manage to thrive so long as they avoid preying on human livestock. But by the novel's end, scant woodland remains, and what little can be found is carefully cultivated, tame, and sterilized of all but the smallest and most adaptable creatures. Most of the streams have dried up or been diverted, while those that remain bubble with chemicals and harbor no life save algae and bacteria. The stench of diesel fumes is inescapable to the nose of fox and hound alike, permeating the very air, and the roar of engines and grinding of machinery prevent the land from ever truly falling into the peaceful quiet that the valley's newer inhabitants never had a chance to know. The land of Todd's birth, welcoming and sheltering to foxes like himself in the first few years of his life, gradually turns against him under the dominion of man, until it is not humanity but he that finds himself an outcast in the valley the fox has inhabited his entire life. Even Todd's legacy is denied to him. In a subversion of one of the most common xenofiction tropes, where the hero continues to metaphorically live on through their descendants, achieving a sort of immortality through bloodline, Todd outlives all of his offspring to die as the last of his kind in the valley. But perhaps most importantly, Mannix shows that these changes do not only affect wildlife. Copper's delicate senses, well suited to a rural life, find the unrelenting noise and noxious stenches of the changed land increasingly unbearable. Domestic animals and even human beings end up falling victim to the poisons employed against unwanted wildlife and even the master is forced to watch his own sense of belonging and purpose slip away from him. For it should not be forgotten that this was the land of his birth as well, one in which he and the denizens of the wild once existed in relative harmony, a balance gradually eroded by the actions of his own kind, including himself. It only seems natural that this leads to the bizarre sense of companionship that he and his prized hound develop with their mortal foe man, hound, and fox forming the old guard of a world that exists less and less with each passing year. But what I find most praiseworthy is that the subtlety with which Mannix incorporates these environmental concerns allows his message to mesh seamlessly into a narrative that, on its surface, appears to be little more than a story about animals. In my view, the three elements of The Fox and the Hound that set it above its xenofiction predecessors are Mannix's level of dedication to realism in representing his animal characters, the fact that the story's environmentalist messaging is woven into every aspect of the novel, and the subtlety with which this is accomplished. And if I had to choose one of these in particular as the reason I celebrate this novel as a masterpiece, it would be the third. Subtlety in writing is a complex topic, to say the least. And naturally, there will always be a degree of interpretability. What one reader or viewer sees as clever, another may find blatant. What one finds profound, another may think prosaic. And what one views as thoughtful, another may deem preachy or simplistic. That being said, the adage show don't tell is widely touted as one of the key components of strong writing. And I think many people fail to apply this rule to messaging and themes, to the detriment of their work. Show don't tell, in its most widely used sense, simply means that it is more effective to show something to an audience than to tell it to them. In literary terms, this can be as simple as having a character spit a question rather than writing, they asked angrily, or showing them grin at learning something rather than telling the audience they were happy to hear the news. One of the most famous cinematic examples is seen in the original Star Wars when Luke Skywalker exits his meager homestead and stares off into the sunset as John Williams' wistful score swells. We don't need Luke or another character to tell us what he is feeling, that he wishes to escape his mundane life as a farm boy and see the galaxy at large, 
to win fame and glory and fulfill a grander purpose. Lucas shows all of that to the audience and allows us to infer it. To reference something a little closer to my own heart, when Balto shies away from the white wolf, only to then remember his friend's words, place his paw into the beast's print, and howl alongside it, we don't need the writers to tell us that the hero has overcome his insecurity about his lupine heritage. That dynamic plays out visually on screen. But all too often, writers fail to apply this most fundamental of rules to what is perhaps the most fundamental component of their stories, the underlying themes and messaging. I think this approach not only hurts a work's ability to deliver a message or support a theme, but limits its cultural staying power. And here we come to the topic of allegory versus applicability, something that admittedly exists less as a binary and more on a wide-ranging spectrum. I don't mean to discredit the art of allegory. After all, some allegories are widely remembered and celebrated decades or even centuries after their creation, and are capable of making powerful insights. George Orwell's Animal Farm, for instance, is a direct allegory for the Russian Revolution, with specific characters and events correlating one-to-one -one with real-life historical counterparts. But Orwell's later novel, 1984, not only received greater acclaim, but has maintained a much stronger presence in the public consciousness, and I believe one of the key reasons is its greater applicability. Animal Farm ties itself to specific historical events, and in doing so limits its ability to be interpreted and applied more broadly in a way that 1984 does not. Looking to xenofiction, we can find this process playing out in some of the genre's earliest prominent works. Jack London's The Call of the Wild and White Fang, and Margaret Marshall Saunders' Beautiful Joe were all published within a decade and a half of one another, in very similar political climates, with authors with fairly similar views. All three books were widely successful at the time of their publication, all three received critical acclaim, and all three have concerns for animal welfare and progressive-era political messaging woven into the fabric of their narratives. And yet now, over a century later, the former two novels are still hailed as literary classics, while the latter is merely a footnote in the history of an obscure genre, when it is even remembered at all. Even Black Beauty, the progenitor of literary xenofiction, is remembered more for the works it inspired and the myriad adaptations it has seen, many of which differ drastically from their source, than for its own story. And I believe the reason for this disparity is that Jack London used his stories to explore themes and convey messages, while Sewell and Saunders' stories were little more than messages in and of themselves. The Call of the Wild and White Fang stand on their own merits as strong narratives, and have a degree of universality that Black Beauty and Beautiful Joe's bluntness hindered them from attaining. As Richard Adams, another famed xenofiction author, wrote, It is a curious feature of animal stories, or any fantasy, that they lose their power if they are felt by the audience to be nothing but parables. A parable has got to grip you in its own right as a story. Ultimately, I am of the belief that in the arts, as with nearly everything else, every decision comes at a trade-off. Telling a story with an epic scope will allow for the exploration of a broader array of characters, situations, and themes, but this large scale may hinder the ability of some to become or remain invested, and lead to the narrative feeling impersonal or cluttered. In contrast, telling a smaller scale story might help the audience connect with or relate to the characters, but at the cost of lacking a sense of grandiosity or impact, and limiting the scope of what can be accomplished, discussed, or explored. A one-dimensional villain can allow for more focus on the heroes at the cost of feeling generic or simplistic, while a complex antagonist can lead to more nuanced storytelling while taking attention away from other elements of the narrative. Themes and messaging are no exception. Allegory almost inevitably comes at the cost of applicability. The more you make a story about one specific thing, the more it loses its power to apply to anything else. To me, it makes perfect sense why Richard Adams and J.R.R. Tolkien both steadfastly resisted attempts to classify their most popular works as allegorical. The former ended the introduction of a later edition of Watership Down with the quote, I want to emphasize that Watership Down was never intended to be some sort of allegory or parable. It is simply the story about rabbits made up and told in the car. And the latter famously wrote, I cordially dislike allegory in all its manifestations and always have done so since I grew old and wary enough to detect its presence. I much prefer history, true or feigned, with its varied applicability to the thought and experience of readers, 
I think that many confuse applicability with allegory, but the one resides in the freedom of the reader, and the other in the purposed domination of the author. Having a message is certainly not a problem. After all, it is all but impossible to write a story without one. But subtlety and nuance in delivering that message allow room for audiences to find their own meaning in the work, and to apply it to new subject matter years, decades, or even centuries after its creation, long after the contemporary issues of its author's life and the specific circumstances in which it was crafted have been forgotten. And in hammering home a point too bluntly, a writer risks oversimplifying complex subject matter, increasing the likelihood that they fumble their core message, and to execute a message poorly can often cause it to be ignored entirely or reduce it to the state of mockery. This isn't to say that subtlety and applicability guarantee a work long-term success, or that bluntness or allegorical specificity doom it. Myriad other factors are, of course, at play. The relative obscurity of Mannix's novel, for instance, is almost certainly due to the existence of Disney's highly distinctive adaptation, a long-term obstacle the book's brilliance and initial success unfortunately couldn't overcome. But I still believe that authors should generally strive for both subtlety and applicability in their writing, and I remain confident that their works will usually, if not always, be much better off for it. If The Lord of the Rings had been written to simply be about nuclear weapons and the Cold War, it would convey far less impact and have far less staying power than a story about the universal temptations of power in all its forms, the disruptive and dangerous nature of technological development, and the importance of fighting against evil in defense of what is good regardless of the time and place. If Watership Down had been written about a specific political conflict, as many critics have claimed over the years, it wouldn't have found anywhere near the level of connection with audiences around the world as a story using the far more universal motif of a group of companions driven from their home and forced to venture into the wild to find, establish, and defend a new one. As it stands, The Lord of the Rings has applicability to the Cold War and nuclear weaponry, industrialization and environmentalism, fascism and communism, and any number of other subjects, but it is not solely about any of them. Watership Down has applicability to countless human conflicts across the globe, but it is not about any of them. The more subtle the connections to specific people, events, and ideas, and the more universal the experiences of your characters, the more room your story has to breathe, and the more life among audiences it will likely enjoy as a result. Just look to some of the oldest and most enduring works in the Western canon. Both the Iliad and the Odyssey touch on universal human experiences of conflict and hardship, love and grief, heroism and trauma, piety and hatred. But it doesn't surprise me that the Iliad, a tale of grandiose wars and political intrigue, of kings and gods, has always played second fiddle in our collective cultural awareness to its sequel, the Odyssey, a story of a group of companions simply trying to return home who are willing to brave the worst the world throws at them in order to make it there. Several years after The Fox and the Hound hit bookstores, Daniel Mannix published Troubled Waters, a xenofiction novel told from the perspective of a wild goldfish. And while the book has been praised for the uniqueness of immersing readers in an aquatic environment, the novel is far less subtle in its environmentalist messaging. On nearly every page, Mannix elaborates to the audience in explicit and often exhausting detail about the ecological catastrophe facing many of America's waterways at the time, describing at length the biological effects on his protagonist, and even frequently referencing specific policies and legislation that had either contributed to or could work towards resolving the crisis. Buck was again beginning to suffer. Not only was he panting from lack of oxygen, but the chemicals in the water entered his gills and eroded the protective mucus layer. Also, he was feeling groggy from the creosol waters, and the copper sulfate thrown into some of the sewage to keep down the odor acted as an anesthetic on him. Packing plants dumped pesticides into the river from the washing of vegetables, slaughterhouses added offal, and little streams draining from abandoned mines far inland added to his distress. Unlike the murky river, these streams were comparatively clear, and for the best of reasons. They were charged with sulfuric acid caused by chemical reaction in the old diggings. Nothing, not even the blue-green algae, could live in them. Now another reaction began to take place in the deadly water. Many poisons, even cyanide, do little damage in alkaline water. The river had been originally highly alkaline, 
and the paper processing plants upstream had been allowed to discharge cyanide into the river. But lower down, and in another state, the acid streams from the mines had been added. The townships here were actually rather glad of these streams, as the acid cleared bacteria and helped to clear the river. However, in acid water, the cyanides are deadly not only to fishes, but also to humans. The towns along the bank drew their drinking water from the river, but their purification plants were intended to remove only suspended material and kill organic matter. They did not remove chemicals. The water was clear, and the heavy chlorination masked any other tastes or smells. Taken in small doses, the water was comparatively harmless to humans, but the people in the communities were drinking a slow poison that would eventually prove fatal. Troubled Waters certainly deserves credit for helping to bring attention to the ravaged state of America's waterways in the 1960s and 70s, but at a certain point I can't help but wonder if perhaps that cause might have better been served by writing a non-fiction book in the vein of Jack Olson's expose on predator control. And it would appear that audiences agreed, for while Mannix was at the height of his literary popularity around the time of the book's publication, Troubled Waters failed to impress itself on either critics or the general public. New York Times book reviewer Hal Borland asked much the same question as myself, musing, It is hard to say how effective it will be as preachment. Told factually, the pollution story doesn't seem to make a very deep or effective impression. Today, Troubled Waters has been all but forgotten, even as several of Mannix's other works live on, albeit modestly. And the weaknesses of Troubled Waters contrast quite starkly in my view with the strengths of The Fox and the Hound. Daniel Mannix watched for years as the wildlife-rich lands he loved and lived in were gradually carved up, littered with traps, saturated with poison, and sterilized of their native life in the pursuit of a supposed progress that he and many others found harder and harder to justify with every passing year. And yet, in The Fox and the Hound, he doesn't bluntly lament how horrible these human practices are, or offer easy solutions to undeniably complex problems. Instead, he shows us the consequences of these practices in all their terrible detail. Rather than preach to the reader, he forces them to endure the effects of inaction through the eyes and noses of his characters, to experience life as a fox and hound in a dying land, to the point where audiences might be forgiven for barely noticing that the novel isn't just about a fox trying to escape a hunter and his hound until they get to that final, haunting line. Just as it does in real life, the development of the valley in the novel occurs gradually, and in the background, in a way that someone overly focused on the primary narratives of revenge and survival can easily miss. The cattle and sheep that Todd enjoys teasing and mingling with to throw off pursuers in the earlier chapters steadily vanish as the book progresses, and the rural fields and dirt roads that he contentedly roams slowly give way to busy highways and suburban streets. During Copper's first pursuit of his rival, a group of loggers are presented as nothing more than an obstacle in reaching his goal, and yet to those paying close attention, they are a harbinger of things to come. The earliest hunts that Todd is forced to outwit are jug hunts, a rural American practice by which hunters gather around a campfire to drink and share stories, listening while their baying hounds range throughout the surrounding woodland in pursuit of foxes or other quarry. Todd finds these easy to escape, and even enjoys testing himself against the hounds, rarely finding himself in any real danger. But by the middle of the novel, when the master begins laying traps which Todd takes to springing to amuse himself, Mannix offhandedly notes that the decline of jug hunting, which requires extensive wilderness to properly conduct, had deprived the fox of one of his primary sources of entertainment. Later on, when Todd is forced to range far and wide in search of a second mate, Mannix leaves the implication unsaid that all of the other vixens in his range have either been killed or driven away. And when he brings his newly won mates back to the familiar environs of his birth, they, and their offspring, are unable to survive for long in the changing world of the valley. The use of strychnine-laden baits especially exemplifies the author's show-don't-tell approach, with Mannix forcing the reader to experience the devastating effects of poisoning through Todd who happens to observe and become entangled with the deadly cascade in the course of his hunting. When the fox first comes across one of the poisoned baits, he buries it for later, only for a cat to discover his cache. Returning later and trailing the thief, Todd finds it dead, with its carcass stripped by carrion birds. And nearby, he discovers these birds dead as well, with the skunk who feasted on their corpses likewise deceased. 
When the fox lightly scavenges from the dead skunk, his body is soon racked with agonizing spasms, and he lingers on the brink of death for several days before managing to recover, becoming one of only a handful of his kind in the valley to endure the poisoning campaign that also wreaks havoc on both wildlife and domestic species, and even claims the life of a child. Ultimately, even humans are not exempt from the changes their kind unleash. We watch through Copper and Todd's eyes as the prior inhabitants of the valley gradually vanish, forced to sell off property their families had held for centuries, as the way of life they derive sustenance and meaning from, and the land they love, is steadily eroded beneath the tread of civilization. The descent of Copper's master into depression and alcoholism is conveyed to us through the smell of liquor that assaults the hound's nose with increasing strength and frequency, and the sense of mourning that hangs over the man as their services are called upon less and less often, and the land they once roamed with confidence is carved up and sterilized. Though Mannix himself never specified the Fox and the Hound's setting, the presence of mountain laurel situates it somewhere inland along the east coast of the United States, and the fact that the author himself lived in Pennsylvania and spoke with numerous local fox hunters when researching their practice strongly implies that it takes place in the Commonwealth. But Mannix was well aware of what was happening in the West, and drew on stories from across the country in crafting his magnum opus. In the author's note, Mannix cited an old tale from central Virginia of a fox who led a hound on a more than 50-mile chase over the course of a day and a half, at which point both dropped dead of exhaustion and were buried beside one another. And in an interview following the novel's publication, he cited as a key influence his time among the locals of Arizona's Oro Valley, a previously rural locale that experienced dramatic suburbanization following the Second World War in a manner reminiscent of the book's setting. As a result, the Fox and the Hound possesses a certain geographic and even temporal detachment. The novel certainly touches on specific issues of its day, such as widespread poisoning and industrial waterway pollution, but it isn't about those topics any more than The Lord of the Rings is about classical era warfare, or Watership Down is about housing developments in southern England. In chronicling the story of Todd, Copper, and the human master who looms so large in both of their lives in this manner, Mannix effectively conveys the central message that is wrapped up so brilliantly in that final line, that mankind, no matter how much we may think or act otherwise, is ultimately a part of the environment over which we preside, and in the end, we are given the same choice that our kind forces on all other species, adapt or perish. Mannix's ending is undeniably bleak, but I think it is important to remember the reason. The author meant it not as a prophecy, but as a warning. A potential future that we still had the power to avoid. And for all our species' many subsequent failings, it is a future we have managed to avoid, at least so far. While we certainly face our own ecological challenges and crises today, I think it can be reassuring to look to past successes as we march into an increasingly uncertain future. In 1972, the newly created Environmental Protection Agency enacted a total ban on the use of sodium fluoroacetate, dealing a crippling blow to the predator control programs that had long run rampant across much of the West. The apocalyptic predictions made by proponents of mass poisoning, of the collapse of the sheep industry and a country overrun by coyotes and mountain lions, indiscriminately slaughtering wildlife, livestock, and even humans, never came to pass. The use of 1080 would be re-implemented in a highly limited capacity in 1985, in the form of a poison-laced collar fitted around the necks of sheep, posing a danger only to those individual predators that actively preyed on livestock, a reasonable compromise that both ranchers and environmentalists have long since accepted. That same year, the EPA began implementing the provisions of the Clean Water Act, which, bolstered by subsequent legislation, led to dramatic improvements in the state of America's waterways over the coming decades. Limits placed on grazing have helped to slow, and in some cases even mildly reverse, the desertification of much of the American Southwest and Mountain West, and the abandonment of unused farmland in the face of agricultural consolidation has led to significant reforestation across large swaths of North America, providing numerous species with vital habitat land and contributing to the production of oxygen and the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And the 1973 Endangered Species Act, building off of legislation from the previous decade, 
reversed century-long population trends in many species that until then had been written off as doomed to annihilation. The bald eagle and North American subspecies of mountain lion, both teetering on the verge of extinction by 1970, are now commonplace throughout much of the country 50 years later. The gray wolf, all but exterminated from the lower 48 states, has now seen successful reintroduction in Yellowstone, resulting in dramatic improvements to the park's overall ecology in a highly visible example of the concept of a trophic cascade. And hundreds of wolf packs have been allowed to quietly settle into many other western states and around the Great Lakes with little trouble. The coyote, once feared as a voracious threat to wildlife and livestock alike, has taken to living in our shadow from rural heartlands to the nation's largest cities, aiding in control of rodent and deer populations in the process. That is not to say that we live in total harmony with our wild kin. The occasional cow or sheep will be brought down by wolves, just as wandering cats or even small dogs may find themselves the prey of a passing suburban coyote. And attacks on humans, though rare and almost inevitably involving rabid animals, do still occur. And in turn, human beings will continue to manage populations of various species through hunting and trapping, just as we continue to develop land to sustain ourselves, often in a less-than-ideal manner. So, not some utopian conception of harmony, but a far more realistic form, one of balance. After all, nature has never been bloodless. It has certainly been a long and arduous process, and it is one that must continue, one in which we cannot afford to rest on our laurels. But we are learning to share the world we live in. And with any luck, we will keep on learning. Some lessons cannot bear to be forgotten for long. Throughout Slaughter the Animals, Poison the Earth, Jack Olson repeatedly raises the question, if mankind renders the land uninhabitable to predators, how long can we realistically expect other species, including ourselves, to survive? The author himself has little doubt, as he ominously and poetically concludes his expose with the line, We animals of the earth are a single family, and the death of one only hurries the others towards the final patch of darkness. And I think this is a fitting echo for the final paragraph of Mannix's xenofiction masterpiece, a work of fiction rather than a document of fact, and yet molded by the same concerns, written with the same foreboding, and fueled by the same fire, that we must take care to remain vigilant against our own species' worst excesses, lest there come a day when we find ourselves in a miserable, fouled land that no longer holds any place for fox, hound, or human being. Thank you.